our first step is to run the data set on ArcGIS Pro, which is the leading GIS software in the market. And we'll use this software to process the LiDAR imagery to extract the building footprint. The area of interest for us is a neighborhood in Copenhagen, the capital of Denmark. The name of the area is called Tuborg. And from this TIFF image, which is open on your screen, we will basically it shows us the extent of the neighborhood just for our reference purposes. You can see that there is it's an urban neighborhood with buildings, with parks, with roads and with a water body on its east. In the data set, there are two LiDAR files which are available. As a next step, what we will do is we'll merge these two LiDAR files so that the processing can happen seamlessly. Next, we'll proceed to add those two LiDAR files called LAS, which is a short for laser file because LiDAR is used called interchangeably as laser files as well. There are 5 million and 3 million data points within each of the LiDAR data sets respectively. The points are separated by a margin of 0.3 meters on an average. It is a very dense data set. One of the reasons why LiDAR is so often used because it creates a very vivid three-dimensional representation of the area under observation. A sum total of 8 million points are there and we can see that they have not been classified yet as in they are unassigned at the moment. The coordinate system is ETRS 1989 UTM zone 32N. As a next step, the merged LiDAR dataset will be loaded onto the map. It creates a very colorful vivid representation of the area under observation. The values are color coded as per the elevation. So areas under high elevation are typically yellow, orange and red, whereas the ones with lower elevation values are typically light blue and dark blue in color. Because it is a three dimensional imagery, we can zoom in, explore the properties, see the point cloud for ourselves before we go on to the next processing step. As a next step, what we will do is basically classify the points. As you had already known, the points have been unassigned so far, which is why the image is currently looking gray. If you see on the left on your screen, that is marked as unassigned. Our next point is to basically classify these points, which are at ground level. So we'll use the geoprocessing tool. There is a particular tool which can capture the ground pixels from the LiDAR data set. We'll run this tool now. We select our data set. And we'll run this tool. Straight away, the area which are at the ground level are being marked as brown. By navigating the 3D imagery, the difference between both the classes of pixels are clearly visible. We've done this particular step because we want to eliminate the ground pixel points, whereas the other necessity is we'll use these ground pixel points to create a digital elevation model of the surface. 
The reason why we do this step is because the standard digital elevation model, which is there as part of the base map, is uh, at a very macro level. It is not at the desired accuracy which we need. So our next step is to run the LAS dataset to raster tool, which essentially will be used to convert the points which are classified as ground into a uniform raster layer which contains the elevation value for all the points. We've used a technique called interpolation. As you had known that there is 0.3 meters of gap between the pixels. So our objective was to fill those gaps as well. So using the natural neighbor method, we've classified. The dam has been created. Areas which are high are brighter in color, whereas the areas which are of low elevation are darker in shade. This forms the framework of our processing, the ground points converted into a dem. As a next step, we'll see what are the remaining points because our ultimate objective is to create the building footprint. So is this particular image sufficient to extract building footprint? Not quite. We'll use the classify LAS noise tool because the imagery is not quite appropriate for our requirements yet. Why is it so? Because there are certain features which are taller than a building. For example, a telecom tower or a power line, for example. The first step is to eliminate any errors in the data set. So any point below the ground level. So we've done the minimum height at minus two meters and run the tool. This is called the low noise. The next step is to identify the high noise as in the, the typically the points which are higher than the building. So typically in this neighborhood, the tallest building is 40 meters in size. So we've done the maximum height as 42 meters. So as to eliminate any points which could be taller than those buildings. As a result, once the low noise and high noise has been classified, we can see those demarcations in the red color. Now over here, what is this particular red color? These are construction cranes on top of buildings. So this is a kind of a noise which we eliminate from the data set. There are certain errors, which is the low noise also, which are bordering the coastline as well. So those have been identified as well. All the points are those red points which you see on your image. So initially we've removed, categorized and removed the ground points. Subsequently we've categorized and removed the noise. And so what we are left now are typically your building data points, but that is not all. These could be several other features, for example, vehicles, for example, vegetation and any other material which is not ground and which is not noise would be classified in this cross section of the LiDAR imagery. There is a specific tool now which we will be able to run, which is the LAS building tool. We've classified the rooftop height as well as the minimum area of our average building. These two aspects are necessary so that the tool can identify buildings from this particular data set. Now you may be wondering if the standalone tool existed, then why not run it in the first place? This is because there is a processing chain, a sequence of actions which we need to do and performing the ground point classification and then separating it out from the data set enables this tool to run effectively. The building classification is done basis honing on the LiDAR reflectance properties. So when uh, LiDAR pulse interacts with the building, it basically returns as a single pulse of light to the sensor. Whereas if it interacts with, let's say, leaves of a tree, it returns at as multiple diffused pulses. So this particular tool 
utilizes this particular property of reflectance values to isolate and demarcate buildings. We also have to set the minimum rooftop height as well as a minimum area of a particular building type for this tool to basically isolate the buildings effectively. This is just to clarify that the grey visuals on your screen are the unassigned points as in these aren't the building, the noise as well as the ground level. The next step is to basically transfer the building points which were extracted onto the 2D version of the map. Initially we were exploring the scene in 3D. Now we will do uh, subsequent processing steps in 2D mode. The red pixels on the screen are the building footprints which have been transferred. When we overlay it on top of the ortho rectified imagery, you can see more or less the buildings have been clearly identified. Although there is a difference in perspective because the ortho rectified image was captured from a particular angle, whereas the airborne lidar imagery was captured from another angle altogether. The next processing step is to basically convert these points into a continuous raster imagery. So we select that particular data set and basically the tool classifies a cluster of points which are buildings into a single cell comprising and classified as a building. So once we've run this tool, we can see that the buildings have been colored in a dark gray tone and which we'll change so as to make it much more visible. Now it is pink in color. As we explore the raster imagery, you will see that there are certain inconsistencies. For example, there are certain gaps in the buildings then the building edges are rough. There are certain small objects which have been classified as buildings and perhaps these may not be buildings. So to perform these corrective actions, we need to first convert the raster into individual building polygons. Once we've run this tool, a new layer has been created which is currently colored white but then we will change the color to resemble the pink color which is much more visible on this particular base map. As a subsequent step what we will do is examine the attributes. You will see that a sum total of 796 building polygons had been identified when we had run the classify buildings tool. Now not all of them as I have told you are buildings. We need to perform certain corrective actions on the inconsistencies which we had spotted and elaborated earlier. How do we basically perform these corrective actions? So at first, let's say we want to remove certain features such as the one on the road, which is clearly not a building. And how do we basically remove that? It is a very simple technique. We examine the dimensions of the buildings. We see that they have a particular length. They have a particular area on an average and certain features which are, you know, different and have a clearly, you know, the length of the particular object is below a particular standard or the area is below a particular value, then we basically use a filter to classify, isolate and remove that particular layer. So currently what we are telling the software to do is if the area is greater than a particular figure, which is 70 square meters, then basically you categorize it as a building. Otherwise, you do not categorize it as a building. So once we run this tool, the buildings have been classified and overshadowed by the blue border. But then you see the point on the road, there is no blue border on that particular element or a feature. So which means it has not been selected. So essentially what we are doing as a subsequent step is isolating the buildings and therefore removing the small features which are not buildings. The new layer has been created on your left. As a next step what we will do is regularize the building footprint. 
Now you may wonder what is regularization mean? It basically uses certain geometric properties. We set the tolerance, densification and precision values. Without going into the technicalities of it, essentially what we are saying is if the geometries of a particular feature or a polygon has a tendency to be a building, then please, you know, make it as a smooth edge rather than a very rugged, jagged edge. So once this tool is run and when we, you know, compare it with the previous output with this new output, you see that there is the building has been clearly you can say I have a very smooth edge, which is normal, right? In terms of the real life, the buildings do not have rough edges. They have a very smooth edges. So this is one type of categorization or corrective measure, which we do to make the building footprint even more better. Subsequently, you will see on the left of your screen, a small object, for example, has been incorrectly identified as a building. Now this, matches the building minimum area criteria, but it's still not a building, then what can we do? We can select that particular object and remove it manually. So this is again another type of corrective measure which we can perform. Now over here you see there is an incomplete building wherein the polygon is there, but then it does not reflect the entire building view. It rather on the left hand side, it is basically not clear. So we can use a modify features tool to basically manually draw the outline. And it's not like you'll have to draw the complete outline by yourself. You just have to select the vertices and the tool basically automates the entire process and creates a rectangular shaped object. The next step entails creating 3D representations of the building footprint, which is essentially our objective of this exercise. Now for this to happen, we have to migrate once again through to the 3D view. And then we have to subsequently run a particular tool known as multi-patch. This basically leverages ArcGIS Pro's 3D capabilities to create the buildings in 3D view. We essentially use three data points for this. One is the LIDAR points which were classified as buildings initially. The second one is the cleaned up 2D footprint which we had done in the recent past. And the third one is the digital elevation model which if you remember we had basically created this out of the LiDAR points classified as ground very early on in this exercise. So this last building multi-patch tool utilizes these three data sets to create what would appear on your screen now is the 3D buildings. We colored these buildings in yellow color so as to make it much more visible on the plain white base map. This is the output which we had aspired to create when we had initiated this exercise and after several processing steps and a few corrective steps, this appears to be a very pleasing and a realistic 3D building output. We'll see the attributes from roughly 750 plus buildings, we've now basically isolated to 170 buildings in this particular neighborhood of Tuborg in Copenhagen, Denmark. There's one last step which we need to do to make this 3D representation even more clearer. The base map over here utilizes a world 3D digital elevation model which is by default the 3D view in ArcGIS Pro. Now this is done at a macro level, but then because we have LiDAR data set and we had created a DEM out of it, we will utilize that as part of the base maps elevation model. Now you may wonder what is the reason behind doing it. It appears very realistic. Actually, no. In a short moment, you will see how changing the digital elevation model to a more realistic version 
changes the complete attributes of the buildings. So now you see the ground level of the building is much more smoother. Hence, we've used the digital elevation model to create an even more positionally accurate 3D representation of the building footprint. With this, we conclude our exercise. This exercise is an extension in a way of the previous exercise where we had extracted building footprints. This time we are going a step further and extracting the roof forms. So the first step involves basically loading and exploring the data set. There are two folders, one pertaining to the 3D base map and the second one containing the building related data set, LiDAR data set that is. So once we open the 3D base map on ArcGIS Pro, we will add that particular folder containing the LiDAR data as a folder connection in the software so as to enable us to access the particular LiDAR data set. The 3D base map's role is that it contains all the steps to extract roof forms uh, which has been pre-created by SRE team so that we do not have to remember each and every individual steps by ourselves. So this is just a documented workflow which exists in that particular folder. So as a first step, what we have to do is to create a LAS or a laser data set. Now again, those who have seen the previous video on building footprint would know that this particular step entails merging the various LiDAR files available in our data set into a single LiDAR file because this is a step which is necessary to do the post-processing. In the create LAS data set, what we will do is basically select the four LiDAR data sets. Thereafter, we shall name the data set uh, because it is over the Portland, Oregon area in USA. We'll name the output merged LAS data set as likewise. And then we will ask the tool to basically create a LiDAR point cloud for us. The point cloud has been created. It's a vivid mix of various colors. You can see that the high elevation values are in yellow and red and orange respectively, whereas the low elevation values are in blue, dark blue respectively. It is in feet. The, the measurement is in feet and not in meters. This is something which uh, you must be aware of. So 236 feet is the tallest spot and the 70 feet minus 70 feet is the bottom spot in the particular LiDAR data set. This data has been acquired using airborne LiDAR as in via an aircraft or via a drone. There are a sum total of 1 crore 40 lakh data points in this LiDAR data set. So you can understand it is a very very high resolution, detailed, comprehensive data set, which is why LiDAR is used in the first place because it enables us to get very good length, breadth and height XYZ measurements. This is where we'll do something different from the building footprint exercise. What we'll do is we'll extract the elevation values, but of three different types. One is the default digital elevation model, which captures the height of the features on the ground. But beyond that, we will also extract the digital surface model, which captures not only the height of the ground level features, but then also artificial or natural features above the ground level, such as vegetation or buildings or any other features respectively. And the third data set, elevation data set would be the normalized digital surface model, which is capturing the relative difference, you can say, uh, between the DSM and the DEM. So it is essentially the relative height of features above the ground level. So three different data sets have been created. The layers have been created on your left. Each of them captures the elevation values. Let's switch on the LiDAR point cloud layer once again. We'll do some corrective actions now. 
because you see that the bottom most point is at the height of minus 70 feet so obviously there is certain discrepancy or error in the lidar calculations even the topmost point will you know just verify by clicking on the various features in the data set to understand whether is it a true representation or not subsequently what we will do is the elevation surface values which we had extracted will put a minimum and ma maximum height feature uh, parameter within that so what we are saying is that you do not categorize points which are below zero feet and you do not categorize points which are above 200 and feet 15 feet because 215 feet is above the tallest building in the vicinity so that much of detailing in the data is more than sufficient we do not need any elevation values which are over and above that whereas the minimum of zero feet is uh, self-explanatory because below zero feet uh, the underground features are as it is not captured by the lidar software what we will do as a next step is to load the building footprint layer onto the map view this particular layer is readily available for us as part of this project package we had created this layer from scratch from the LiDAR point cloud in our previous caselet video on building footprint. You may refer to it in case you wish to. The attributes of this particular layer are quite detailed, right from the address to the description to the type to the usage to the elevation values. A whole variety of data is included as part of this layer. Typically, municipal corporations maintain such layers with as much as details they desire. And I believe the source of this particular layer file is also from a similar entity. Subsequently, what we shall do is to uh, change the elevation surface into a more precise uh, version of it. By default, the global elevation layer is good for macro level visualization. But then to have a neighborhood level precision, we are better served to convert the file elevation from the default global elevation to the digital elevation model which we had as part of the uh, which we had created as part of the project package it is positionally also very accurate uh, spatially accurate and directionally accurate subsequently uh, you would have noticed that uh, the values of elevation are mentioned in feet this is to demonstrate that uh, using a raster calculator we can convert these values into any particular dimension which we choose to capture in this case we will convert it into meters units of measurement so how do we go about doing it is multiplying the feet values by 0 0.3 which would give us the values in meters once we load the formula in the raster calculator tool, the computation is done and the layer, new layer has been created. Subsequently, we will reproject the digital terrain model. Reprojection is a technical concept for those who are not familiar with it. To put it simply, we are changing the coordinate system of the layer in question. In this case, the digital terrain model, which we had created in meters. We do so, so as to maintain consistency between this layer and the other layer, because in the subsequent processing steps, multiple layers will be used together for doing certain precise computation. And if the layers do not have a standard projection, then it basically leads to errors in computation. What we will do as a next step is to have this reprojected digital elevation model as part of the elevation surface. So if you remember what we had done previously was to include the digital terrain model in place of the global elevation default in ArcGIS. This time we are even making it much more accurate by including the reprojected digital elevation model as part of the uh, surface elevation. We can do a few more steps such as publishing what 
we have created so far in this exercise onto the web for sharing it with public and other stakeholders. But for this particular ex exercise, we will not do that. To distinguish a particular roof form from another is a challenging task which requires a high level of precision. So as a first step, what we will do is to run the segment roof parts tool. What essentially it does is take the current 2D building footprint, which is a very basic representation comprising of simple shapes into a much, much more complex representation, which mimics reality. We use the digital surface model to add a moderate level of spectral and spatial detailing to the footprint layer. Once the result comes out, you will see that it now comprises of very many complex shapes and patterns. A sum total of 1039 unique shapes have been created once we have run this tool. Initially, the building footprint had only 940 such shapes. So a fine layer uh, enhancement of detailing has been added in this new layer. Now that we have the 2D building footprint, which is realistic in nature, we will use that as well as the three elevation surfaces, which we had created at the beginning of the exercise, the digital surface model, the digital elevation model and the normalized elevation model to basically create the 3D building footprint, which forms a basis for us to create and isolate and distinguish the roof forms. So using the create buildings tool, we will now move on to creating the accurate 3D building footprint. Once the tool runs, we will be able to uh, use the symbology to basically depict it on the map view because currently as you would know that it is the map view is 2D in nature but the new layer which we've created is three dimensional in nature. So we need to uh, configure the symbology so as to allow the software to depict the newly generated 3D building footprint layer in a nice three-dimensional form. The symbology rule packages have been added. They have been uh, part of our project package file uh, in advance. We, need, we didn't have to create it separately. And once we've done this, the building footprints are now visible on your screen. It is still currently displaying in the two-dimensional form. But as we navigate the scene in 3D, the building footprint layer is clearly visible in its three-dimensional form. Let's explore the attribute table. Because this is a 3D layer, a shape area field also has been computed. But more importantly, what is also computed is the type of the roof form. Three varieties of roof forms have been captured. One is hip, flat and gable. These are standard North American type of roof forms available over there. Upon examining the statistics, we are seeing that the flat roof form is the most common followed by gable and then followed by hip. Now, is this the end of the processing? Not clear, not quite, because we need to check the accuracy and repair any errors in the building footprints which have been generated. So, when we review the buildings, we begin by using the confidence measurement tool. This tool allows us to compute the root mean squared error, the RMSE for the building elevation values. Essentially, the 3D footprint's elevation values are compared to the digital surface model which we had generated earlier and any inconsist inconsistencies are measured and displayed as the RMSE which you are going to see in a moment's time. We see when we sort the RMSE in uh, descending order that there are roughly 800 plus building footprints which have a root mean squared error of above 3 feet. 3 feet is a kind of a benchmark for us. We would like our building footprints to have a 
error of less than 3 feet. If we select a particular row from the attribute table, automatically ArcGIS highlights that building footprint. Subsequently, what we will do is to visualize this particular layer based on the RMSE values. As we load that particular step, it is important for me to convey that the tasks section which you see on the left of your screen is a predetermined uh, created workflow which we have downloaded from the ArcGIS solutions page. There are nearly 125 plus such workflows out there for any person who is willing to uh, explore, uh, let us say, an avenue in emergency management, in say capital project planning, in fire hydrant inspection and a variety of other workflows. You can go and explore that for yourself on ArcGIS solutions page. As a next step, as I have said, we will visualize the building footprints as per the RMSE. What we have done is loaded the symbology file which has certain commands and instructions on how to basically visualize the same. So, we do not have to manually set the parameters, but essentially what we have done is we have categorized the footprints using different color combinations. So, a footprint with a green outline is having a favorable RMSE, whereas a footprint with a red outline has an, a highly unfavorable RMSE. So, subsequent to this categorization, we will initially begin working by re repairing or fixing the building footprints which have the highest RMSE. Often we toggle between the views of 3D and 2D because certain uh, workflows are much more suitable, less cumbersome to be done on 3D and sometimes it up is applicable the same way for a 2D application. Sometimes it is even better to have both the 3D view and the 2D view stacked side by side so as to get a 3D perspective of the area under observation as well as uh, see a uh, depiction in 2D as well for better understanding, which is exactly what we have done over here. We will switch on the LiDAR point cloud. The area under highest elevation is containing the root mean squared error. So, we will see why is that particularly the case. It has an elevation value of 230 meters. And the RMSE value is 28 feet, which is much above the 3 feet, which is desirable for us and hence it is marked in the red color. It is often important to save the ArcGIS project at regular intervals, so as to enable us to uh, have the latest project package in place just in case a uh, malfunction happens and the application has inv inadvertently it shuts down or the PC turns off and so on and so forth. Next we will proceed to show a live demonstration of how to basically correct a particular error. What you are seeing on your screen on the right is that the underlying imagery is from a different perspective as in it has been captured from a different angle and you know the building outlines do not fall directly above the imagery. So, to visualize it better 
we also have an option in ArcGIS Pro to download historical imagery. So we've downloaded the imagery from 31st May 2017 as it is captured from a particular angle which would directly complement the building footprints uh, angle which has been it has been captured from. You see now the underlying building footprint is closely resembling the base map. What we will do is correct the shape over here because the elevation value uh, right at the middle where there appears some sort of a exhaust fans over there. So it the, the shape which was detected was slightly distorted as in it was away from it. So we use a manual tool to edit the vertices so as to place it directly on top of the particular cross section of the building roof. Now what is the benefit of this? You see straight away the line is now colored yellow because now it corresponds to the surface elevation model much more closely as in the root mean square error is much lesser. So initially it was orange but then after we have manually edited the vertices to closely resemble the uh, roof's uh, exhaust section, uh, we have basically reduced the RMSE and the footprint is now much much more accurate. With this we come to the conclusion of this video caselet. The roof forms which we have extracted from the LiDAR imagery can be used in subsequent workflows such as urban planning and zoning as well as more technical workflows such as solar and shade analysis which is useful for residential and commercial rooftop solar planning purposes. There are three folders available to us. The small data folder contains the small training data set. The test data folder contains the large training data set. And the results folder contains the output from a previously conducted study over a large data set. Before we run ArcGIS Pro, it is imperative for us to install deep learning libraries because without this, we will not be able to perform the workflow on the ArcGIS Pro. There are three pillars in a deep learning workflow, which is first to prepare the training data. The second one is to train the model using the training data. And third is to use the model to identify the objective from the unseen data. Once we set up ArcGIS Pro and uh, reference it to the folder where all these data sets are stored, we can initiate the first step which is to train the deep learning classification model using the small training data set. Why do we feel the need to accurately classify power lines? For a very simple reason is because it is a sensitive infrastructure which is exposed to risk such as fire from adjacent trees, obstructions on its way, hawkers on the ground and so on and so forth. There are 4 million data points in our small training LiDAR data set and these have already been classified as building, ground and several other types. The most important being serial number 14 which is the conductor wires which is essentially the power lines. So in the 4 million data points there are roughly 21,000 points which have been classified as power lines. We will load this LiDAR data set, which is the small training data set, onto the map view. We can begin exploring the three dimensional colorful LiDAR data set, which is on the map view now. The elevation values range from 811 feet to 1238 feet, which signifies that this is a slightly hilly terrain. You can see the outline of the power line in the map view. It is kind of, you can say, easy to discern. And you can also see that it is surrounded by a dense vegetation, a whole lot of what seems to be like coniferous trees. We will also load the validation data set onto the view. 
the validation data set lies adjacent to the small training data set. The presence of this particular data set helps the deep learning model to work effectively in a wide variety of situations. To explain this using the sunflower example once again, we not only want to be able to detect sunflowers in similar settings, let's say in a small garden, but then we also want the model to be able to detect sunflowers in a large forest also. So the validation data set typically is much, much more diverse in nature and different to the training sample data set. Instead of displaying the LiDAR point cloud as per the elevation, we've now changed the symbology to display it as per the classification. So the power lines are currently visualized in yellow color, transmission towers in blue color, the trees and vegetation in green and so on and so forth. Similarly, we'll apply the same symbology to the validation layer as well. Symbolizing as per the classification helps us to easily spot the various features on the map view. Next up, we'll begin the training process. In the geoprocessing tool, we will refer to the prepare point cloud using the training data. There are several technical parameters involved and uh, the purpose of this exercise is not to explain them. However, at a broad level, we are redirecting the geoprocessing tool to use the training small data set as the input point cloud. There is a training boundary as in, you know, you know that the particular power line runs through the middle of the data set. So you have setting a boundary that, you know, please do not uh, process the points which are far away from that center point. Again, the same rule applies for the validation point cloud and its boundary. The block size is a technical parameter. It is essentially telling, we are telling the software is that 82 feet is the potential size of a power line between two transmission towers. And you basically use that particular block size to uh, classify the DL algorithm. The histogram output helps us to examine whether the number of LiDAR points within each block is sufficient or not. If it isn't, then we run the risk called subsampling, which kind of distorts the classification algorithm's effectiveness. Because there are sufficient LiDAR points within each block, that essentially tells us that we can accurately detect the power lines from the particular block. Thereafter, we will use the next tool, which is the train point cloud classification method. In this, we use the output of the previous step, which is the training data. This becomes the part of the input training data. Also, we set a minimum points per block as 2000, because we know that if there is any block which has less than 2000 points, it is surely not going to contain very many power line features as potentially it is located far away from the center point of the data set where there is a conglomeration of the power line LiDAR points. What you also need to know is that it is not always that we strive perfection from the classification model. Sometimes we are limited by the computing resources we have Sometimes we are limited by the time we have at our disposal. So we have to strike a balance where we need to get a certain level of accuracy also from the data set as well as to uh, minimize the resource and time consumption also. So for example, in this particular workflow, we the recommended GPU size is uh, very high. But then if somebody has a lower GPU, then he has to relax the parameters so as to make the processing quicker and get a seemingly uh, effective result as well. One point I would like to clarify is that these tools take a lot of time and while the video is fast forwarded uh, to account for you know ease of viewing, uh, it these, these steps are not very quick to operate. While this training takes a long time to complete, 
we can monitor the progress. So you can see that there are certain layers of information which are continuously being added at regular intervals. There is something known as an epoch, which is a kind of a cycle in which uh, the entire training data set is passing through the neural network of the deep learning algorithm. We are basically processing this classification model across 10 epochs. Then there is something known as a training loss and a validation loss. The training loss indicates how well the deep learning model is working on the small training data set, whereas the validation loss indicates how well the model is working with the validation data set. Both these loss figures tend to decrease with each passing epoch, at least during the initial phases, which signifies to us that the model is learning as and when more and more data passes through it and the more iteration it does. To explain precision and recall values in terms of the sunflower example, precision is if the model detects there are 10 sunflowers and out of which there are actually 8 sunflowers, that means that the precision is 80%. Whereas, if the model is able to detect 6 sunflowers in an image and there are actually 10 sunflowers in the particular image, then the recall value is 60%. For this particular analysis, the recall value is very important to us because we want to know the number of true positives in comparison to the actual objects. The processing step is complete. In the final epoch, the recall value is 86%, which is alright considering we had trained it using a small sampling of points only. As part of the completion step, a few graphs and excel sheets have been generated. For example, this graph shows how well the model was responding to the training data set as well as the validation data set. We see that there was a symmetry in between the model's response to both these type of data sets. When we visualize the performance of this particular model epoch wise, we can uh, see that there are two categories, two levels of classification, right? We had classified the LiDAR data set based on the whether it is a power line or not. So, when we sort this data set, we will see in which epoch did the classification model perform the best. It is in epoch number 4, where the model had the highest recall value, as in it performed the maximum number of accurate detections of power lines. Make note that this is the performance in the small data set. The large data set has been trained on a 24 GPU system uh, which allowed the person who had run that analysis to set more rigid parameters and identify the best recall value from that particular system. When we see the output Excel of that particular workflow and examine in which recall, in which epoch was the recall value the highest. There were a sum total of 22 epochs compared to the 10 epochs which we had run on our system. So out of these 22 epochs, in which epoch was the wire conductor having the best recall value is for us the objective in this particular processing step. We can find that in epoch number 16, the recall value was 92 percentage, which means that out of every 100 power lines which are there, power line points which are there, this particular model was able to detect 92 points accurately, which is a much better performance rate compared to the 85 percent which we had done using the small data set. Hence, therefore, 
we will train the classification model using this particular epoch and then ask the model to identify the power lines in a new data set which comprises 2 million plus laser data points and to identify the power lines from it. This particular test data set is currently visible on your screen in the 3D mode. We will classify the layer as per its classification because it's a unseen data there is no classification so each and every point is unassigned so this is our objective which is to use the pre-trained model at the best epoch to identify which points in this particular lidar data set are power lines So we will run the classify point cloud using train model tool in which we will link the parameters to the various data sets. We already have the target point cloud test data set which we extracted from the zip file at the beginning of this video. Also there is a model definition which we will basically link to the epoch number 16 where we found the best performance. Subsequently, we will ask the model to specifically classify the power lines because that is what our objective is. So, the remaining classifications are not important to us. We want to know the power line classification. Once we've run this tool, we need to symbolize it so as to display the classification which has been generated as the output of this model. You can see the bright yellow in between the brown points. So that bright yellow is the power lines. The transmission towers have not been classified. So what we are just seeing is the power lines in the dense forest landscape. Isn't this wonderful? how the DL model has worked on unseen data using a pre-trained model and identify what are the power lines. Now, these yellow lines are actually not lines. These are small, small points. We can actually link up these points to create a line using the extract power lines tool, which is specifically built for such applications. The parameters are simple. We will use the LiDAR data set as well as the output generated and request the tool to create a line out of the point cloud data set. The data set has been created, but it is not clearly visible at the moment because the point cloud layer is also active. You may be able to see a patch of red in between the yellow. That is exactly the power line which has been generated using this tool. If we switch off the older layer, you can see the power lines have been identified with a great deal of accuracy. So we get to know the geometry, we get to know the elevation and a variety of spatial information from using this step. With this, we come to the conclusion of our caselet number three, which is to extract power lines from LiDAR dataset. Thanks for watching.